In this video, we'll examine some specific features of the consequences of state responsibility with respect to IHL violations. Firstly, we ask how to identify the injured state in case of IHL violations. To answer that question, we must look at Article 42 of the Articles on State Responsibility. As you know, Article 42 considers three different situations in which a state can be qualified as an injured state. It is clear that the first situation, which relates to violations of bilateral obligations, is not relevant in case of ITIL violations. ITIL obligations are indeed not of bilateral nature. They are rather owned to a group of states or the international community as a whole. We must therefore determine which of the two other situations envisaged under Article 42 are relevant in case of IHL violations. The third situation concerns interdependent obligations, that is, obligations the violation of which radically changes the situation of all the other states. This does not seem to be the case of IHL obligations which are not interdependent. So the relevant situation for identifying the injured state in case of IHL violations seems to be the second situation envisaged under Article 42. That is, the situation when, in case of multilateral but not interdependent obligations, the injured state is the state that can demonstrate that it has been specifically affected by the violation. It is only then that such state could enjoy all the benefits of the consequences of state responsibility, including the right to demand cessation, get full reparation, take countermeasures, and so on. Secondly, we must emphasize that the right to get full reparation does not mean that full reparation will necessarily be given to the injured states. Case law concerning in particular reparations for war damage has identified certain limits to that right. For example, by allowing the responsible state not to pay its whole debt if the required indemnity is self-destructive, in the sense that it would endanger the existence of the state itself, or by recognizing, as the Eritrea Ethiopia Claim Commission did, that the human rights principle according to which a people cannot be deprived from its own means of subsistence can be invoked to reduce the obligation of reparation. Thirdly, although it is not disputed that the injured state is entitled to take countermeasures against the responsible state, one must remember that such countermeasures could never consist in violation of IHL, but only in the violations of other types of reciprocal obligations. Fourthly, it has been argued in legal scholarship that even states other than injured state, in the sense of Article 48 of the Articles on State Responsibility, could obtain full reparation in their own right, rather than being merely entitled to claim the performance of the obligation of reparation in the interest of the injured state. It is the view of a universal right of states to get reparation in case of IHL violations. However, it is founded upon Common Article 1 to the four Geneva Convention. Yet, that article was not drafted with the intention of modifying the principles regulating the law of state responsibility. In addition, Article 1 was drafted when those principles were only concerned with the right of the injured states to obtain reparation. Finally, we have seen that the legal consequences of state responsibility do not always merely entail obligations upon the responsible state, but can also create obligations for all states. This is the case when certain fundamental obligations are breached. In that case, every state is obliged not to recognize the situation resulting from the violation, 
not to aid or assist in maintaining that situation and to cooperate to put an end to it. Actually, the same three obligations also seem to be provided under the IHL treaties themselves. We have indeed seen that they are generally considered to be implied by the obligation set out in Common Article 1 to the four Geneva Conventions to ensure respect for IHL, 